Good morning, it's Jeff Christian from CPM Group. It's about 9.55 uh, a.m. on Friday morning, the 19th of November here in New York. Uh, I wanted to talk today about inflation and gold, and there's some useful information that I'll show you on COMEX silver inventories and open interest. I will talk a little bit about the market. Um, CPM Group had its open forum uh, Wednesday for clients, uh, which is just an open Q and A. It went about uh, 75 minutes. Uh, really good. A lot of good questions that came in. There were a couple questions that I thought I reviewed today because they're they're more important and they're broader, uh, relating to inflation and inflation's relationship to gold prices. One of the questions was, why have you CPM Group? regularly declared uh, that the Fed's uh, declaration that inflation is transitory uh, when clearly uh, inflation was increasing. Well, we'll get back to that in a second. And then the other uh, the other area was gold touched $800 or came close to $800 uh, three times in history on a monthly average basis in 1980, 2011, 12, and 2020. Uh, what's meant by real money, uh, real prices, really is what it was. Uh, do you use the CPI? And then there was a sub question, which was very interesting. Um, and it led to some research on our part. Uh, if it's the CPI, it excludes the biggest expense in house, uh, of housing, mortgages, property taxes, et cetera, then can it be real? So I did some work now actually, Housing costs, and I'll show you some data in a little bit. Housing costs are the largest component of the consumer price index. About 32% of the consumer price inflation index in October was attributable to housing costs. Uh, it's normally around 40, but with the price increases in other uh, goods and services uh, in October, uh, you saw it reduced to 32%. So when I saw this question, I, it was very interesting. I said, well, wait, 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 you know, shelter is what the CPI uh, uh, economists call it because it's, it's rent and it's the costs of owning a house, uh, shelter, if you don't rent. And shelter is the largest component and it has always been. So I said, well, that's interesting. Why is this guy saying that? And I found that on you know certain dark corners of the bad internet, there are demagogues who say, well, you know, housing costs are skyrocketing and they're not included in the CPI. And that's actually true. If you're buying a house, those costs are not necessarily included in the CPI. They may be, I, I actually have to study that more and it's not particularly what I want to study. I've got other things to do that are more directly related to gold and silver and platinum and palladium and molybdenum and manganese and tantalum and all those other metals and oil and agriculturals, which is what we actually study. But most people don't buy a house every month, but they do maintain the cost of that housing, mortgages, property taxes, and other things. And those operating costs of owning a house do factor in to the CPI. And in fact, are the largest component of the CPI. I'll show you some data in a little bit because it's kind of interesting and it ties in with something that we've seen all of our lives in the markets. Now, why do we think it's transitory or why do we, why have we been saying, we haven't been declaring that the Fed is right. What we've been saying is that most of the inflationary pressures we've been seeing over the last 12 months or so are transitory. There are some secular or semi-permanent uh, factors that are driving inflation uh, indices higher, and they are interesting to follow. But the vast majority of the factors are transitory. Now, a lot of people tend to look at inflation as year over year. And this is a chart, the blue line is what we call headline inflation. It includes energy, and food, which are more volatile than other things that people buy month in, month out, day in, day out. Uh, and then the, the maroon line is all items, less food and energy, what economists call core inflation. 
and you can see, yeah, core inflation is running four, five percent right now, uh, four, 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 four point eight percent, and and headline inflation has been running five, you know, five point four, and then it spiked up to six point two in October. So if you look at it on a year-over-year -year basis, it's kind of scary, but you have to remember that you know you can see a little bit over here october november december you're looking at august september october of 2021 compared to august september october of 2020 and at that time last year the world was locked down people were told to shelter in their homes they weren't going out they weren't eating out they weren't buying a lot of stuff they were basically locked down and in that environment the price levels of what goods and services were out there were pretty darn low now people are coming back out getting sick again but that's beside the point um they're coming back out and they're buying things and they are eating out i'm going out to lunch today and then i'm going to do some christmas shopping and that is pushing the price up relative to where it was a year ago we look at it this way, but we also look at it this way. These are the month to month changes. And you can see, you know, a year ago, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, pretty low inflation. It got higher over the course of the first quarter of this year as the vaccines were coming in and people were coming out of their holes and going back out and buying stuff, the prices started rising. And the vast majority of the increases were in energy and food. And, and used automobiles. And if you looked at the inflation rates back then, it's like 40% plus uh, in oil-based energy, not necessarily natural gas or other energy uh, components, and 40 plus percent in used cars. And everything else was single-digit inflation. It got higher March, April. April got to 0.8, came back a little bit in May, went up to 0.9 in June. And I believe the Fed used that term transitory in April, maybe it was March. It said, hey, you know, a lot of this is, is transitory. A lot of it's year over year statistics, but a lot of these uh, cost increases will pass. And it did, you know, in July, 0 0.4, 0 0.3 in August, 0 0.4 in September, and then it spiked up in October. And that was a real problem. And we talked about it in, um earlier this month when we were talking about what was going on in inflation but if you look and i used this chart perhaps last week in a uh, presentation uh carlos sanchez and our staff pulled this together this is the these are the month to month thing core and and headline inflation and you can see the interesting thing is the blue line is headline inflation and you can see last year it fell much more sharply than core inflation food more than half of which is food purchased for consumption outside of the home these days, and energy, specifically oil. You might remember that the spot oil price went negative in Cushing, uh, Oklahoma for an hour or two last year because there was so much oil lying around that they ran out of storage space. The real price of oil was, fell down to about $20 or so from a much higher price. So we had headline inflation actually fall very low, but we also had core inflation very low too, because people weren't buying stuff. They weren't going out shopping and they weren't doing stuff like that. And you can see that the annual, av the, the average over uh, about a year there was very low, 1%, 1.5%. That was transitorily low because of the lockdown. Now we're in the, post-lockdown recovery phase and expansion in the United States and China, and we have transitorily high inflation figures. Let me see, I show you something else here. And I've actually used this, where is it? Um, I've used this several times in presentations and I'm trying to find it now. Um, bear with me for a minute. 
there. Um, so this is the monthly statement by uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics on the CPI. It's 38 pages long. And I brought it to gold bug conferences where you have these people say, well, CPR, they, they lies about what the inflation is. And say, have you ever even read this? Because most of the people haven't, including the people who come up with bogus uh, alternatives to inflation figures. This is a 38 page document on consumer prices. Now, here's that one chart I just showed you the month to month. This is where we got it. This is the annual uh, year over year inflation figures. but the rest of the report, now I'm on page two here, 38 pages. The rest of the report is a breakdown of inflation. And I want to show you a few things. First of all, there's some text about what's going on in these things. Let's go to page nine. Um, by the time you get to page seven, page eight, page nine, table one, consumer prices, um, you can see all items, food and energy, and then they say all items, less food and energy. That's the core. They have commodities, less food and energy. The next one is services. Uh, and then it would be a thing called shelter. It's right here, uh, if you can see. Shelter was 32% of the cost index of what people were paying for last month. As I said, it's actually down from 40%. It's very high. Yeah, so you have people who go around saying, hey, yeah, the, the consumer price index, it's bogus, inflation is much, much higher. They don't even include the cost of housing in there. Well, they actually do. And they have what they call rent for primary residents and then owner's equivalent rent for, of residences. Because if you look at the housing, you know, until recently, about a third of the people in the United States rented their, their shelter. About a third of the people bought and owned their homes, but were paying mortgages and, and maintenance fees and, and other things on it. And another third of the people bought their houses and paid off their mortgages and they were free and clear. So they had much lower uh, operating costs. They paid taxes, they paid utilities and stuff like that. So you don't include the purchase price because that's a capital investment, if you want, or capital expenditure. You include the operating expenditures, which is the equivalent of what you would be paying if you were paying rent for that, but you're actually paying it elsewhere in mortgages and such. But there are people who go around telling you stuff, just not like nonsense. Now I wanna go forward, because table two is really cool. This breaks it down. This shows you not only what the, C, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics are collecting data on from thousands of people who fill out surveys every month across the country. What did I buy this month and what did it cost? Pre compared to, and then they compare that to what it cost the previous month and 12 months ago. And you can see the weightings, you know, everything added up to 100%. Uh, cereals, 0.29%. You know, Again, you can go through this, you can see all kinds of breakdowns. This is like 17 pages of data and it's incredibly uh, minute. Education, what did people pay? Tuition, postage, telephone services, other personal services. There's all kinds of really interesting stuff in here. And this tells you what people are doing by region and elsewhere. And you can get all kinds of really cool information from it, it tells you what looks transitory and what doesn't look transitory. Well, let's pivot on to gold. This is a chart that I think somebody was referring to. You can see, you know, gold prices rose very sharply. The blue, the dark blue line is real inflation adjusted terms, adjusted for inflation as measured by the US Consumer Price Index. And people will say, well, why do you use the US dollar, US index? Well, first off, we are still the largest economy in the world. Uh, and uh, inflation affects the currency, the US dollar, 
And the US dollar represents something like 70, 75% of private held financial wealth in the world. So US inflation is very important to the US, it's important to the world, but it's also very important because it affects the dollar and the dollar is the de facto, de, de facto reserve currency, not only for central banks, which own about 62% of their foreign exchange reserves in dollars, but also individuals around the world who own dollars. Yeah. Um, so you can see it's very volatile. If you look at the real purchasing par price, uh, purchasing capacity, uh, of, of prices, which is really the real price, you can see that it's ranged from 100 to 800 over the period since 1969, 68, when 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 gold prices were freed to flow. So when people say that there's a stable purchasing power of gold, yeah, it's within a range of 100 to 800 on an index basis over the time. You know, oh yeah, there are times when it's the same but there's a great volatility in the purchasing power of gold over time. Um, but that's another subject. Gold, here's getting into the issue of the relationship between gold and inflation. Inflation, as you can see in the red line, was very high in the 70s, you know, 13, 14 percent. And then it came down with Paul Volcker uh, taking over the Fed in October of 1979. He, drove, he, he, he killed inflation. And he did it by throwing us into a, a double dip recession. Uh, at the bottom of that recession, there was a global financial crisis and they, they reflated, uh, they pumped enormous amounts of money into the economy to get us out of that. Gold prices had actually fallen to about $280 an ounce in 1982 during the second of the double dip recessions. And when the Fed and other central banks started pumping money, throwing it from helicopters, as somebody once said, um, to get us out of that recession because of the debt problems that were emerging in Latin America, people saw that money and they said, my goodness, this has got to be hyperinflationary. And investors poured into the gold market and drove the gold price to $500 within six months. Actually, it wasn't inflationary because once we got out of the recession, the Fed sold bonds to pay for the deficits, which had gone from $58 billion in Carter's last deficit to something on the order of $300 billion by 1982 in Reagan's second or third deficit uh, budget. So he sold bonds, sopped up the excess liquidity, and inflation never came. And investors saw that in, starting in early 1983, they sold off gold and it went back down to about $280 an ounce uh, between 1983 and 1985. But inflation never really came back. Gold has come back. And this is a very important point for gold investors. Gold has come back. It went from $270 in 2000 to $1,800, $1,900 in 2011, came back down, and now it's at record levels. And it did that in a period without inflation. In fact, inflation stayed low, you know, it was like four, three, four, five percent, and then it moved lower and it was around two, three percent, and then it moved lower and it was below two percent. And the Fed was saying, gee, inflation's too low. I'm not sure that I agree with that, but that's beside the point. Who am I to say, as the Pope would say? And inflation has been very low. And gold prices have gone from $270 to $1,860 today. So the point is, investors are buying gold, but not for inflationary purpose reasons. They're not, not, they haven't been buying gold for the last 20 years over inflation concerns, it's everything else. And I showed the, this chart a few weeks ago, I believe, this is sort of a, a very over, high level thing. You know, we look at why do investors buy gold? Well, as an inflation hedge, as a currency hedge, as a safe haven against all sorts of personal, regional, national, and international political, economic, and financial uncertainties and concerns and, and risks. Inflation and currency volatility are only two of those. Uh, there's a lot of other things. Bank financial stability, stock market, as a form of savings. A lot of people, and we, we say it all the time, 
should hold some gold in as in their wealth pile as a form of savings, as an alternative asset, you know, to, uh, hedge your stocks and bonds. And we've showed you data about how if you have 25, 30% of your wealth in gold or silver, that seems to be historically, that has been the optimal amount of your wealth that you should have in, in gold uh, to, to reduce the risk of your portfolio, the volatility of your wealth, uh, while not hampering and actually increasing the capital appreciation of your wealth. Over 30%, it starts to be too risky, uh, and under 30 and under 25 percent, you're not maximizing your returns uh, while you are reducing your risks, your portfolio volatility, portfolio diversifier, and as a commodity. People buy gold for different reasons. And you can see about half of these things, currencies, savings, alternative assets, we think are flashing green for gold investors and have been flashing green for gold investors since 2018. Buy gold, buy gold. And some of them actually 2013 and 2014. There are half of the factors that drive investors, you know, should I buy gold? Should I buy more gold? Should I buy less gold? Half of them for several years now have been saying buy gold, buy more gold. Inflation has been orange, yellow. It's not exactly scary. It hasn't been actually until now. Uh, uh, and our, in our view, it's still not very scary. We're still much more concerned about deflationary pressures on a long-term basis once the world recovers from the deflation, uh, from, from the lockdown. Uh, and the commodities is pretty well supplied. So these are the factors that have been causing investors to buy gold. And you can buy gold because of all of these concerns, not because, and you know, one of them is inflation. But you have to understand the nature of that inflation. And then you say, oh, okay, it's kind of, uh, and then this is a chart. <clears throat> this is from our 2021 gold yearbook. You can find this table <clears throat> and charts and tables and, and, and textual discussion explaining this. But you can see the correlation, the statistical correlation between real gold price changes and changes in various economic and financial factors and inflation since 1970, it's been a 9% correlation. So that's not particularly high. When inflation's 12%, 14%, people buy a lot of gold because of inflation and, and you have a, a period of high uh, correlation. 2008 to 2020, since the global financial crisis, the relationship has been negative 5%. Gold has been rising in an absence, actually a decline in inflation. And you can see the trade weight of dollar, Dow Jones, S&P. I won't bore you with all this stuff. It's in the gold yearbook if you want to see it. Now, I want to run through a few charts because <clears throat> we've seen some strange things being said in the, the on the bad internets about silver. These are silver inventories uh, in COMEX registered depositories. And you can see the blue part are registered uh, with the COMEX against COMEX futures or options positions, future positions. And the eligible stocks are silver in those depositories that can be delivered and become registered at a click of a computer with a key uh, that it meet the COMEX specs. And there's a reason why the COMEX breaks down and reports registered and eligible. Prior to the late 1980s, they only reported registered stocks. And in order to increase the transparency and to avoid certain strange behaviors on the part of some traders, uh, they started requiring eligible stocks to be reported too. Because basically people would see registered stocks falling and they'd say, this is incredibly bullish. And they didn't realize that the stocks were simply being deregistered and once the price rose, they would be re-registered and the price would fall back. So by increasing the transparency and say, okay, these stocks have been deregistered, but they're sitting in the depository and they can be redeposited back then in the 1980s overnight. You would go to the COMEX clearinghouse and say, I have these uh, the silver or gold in a depository that is registered to, to hold COMEX registered uh, stocks. Here are the things, 
give me uh, here here are the the depository receipts. I'm registering it with the comic. And 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 so in order to allow investors to see what that relationship is, they started reporting eligible stock, uh, and they still do. I'm sure that people who don't quite understand that will make hay out of it uh, in a very short period of time. Now, I've talked in the past the difference about between an analyst who studies all the information and says, what does this mean? And a demagogue who picks out little pieces of information and says, hey, you can see, you know, it's the communists or the Democrats or, or various racial <clears throat> and ethnic groups or religious groups. It's Al Qaeda and they're screwing around with the market. So I saw this week some people talking about this tremendous decline in COMEX registered. This is just the registered portion. This is the little blue stuff down here, but we're looking at just the registered stuff. This is a tremendous decline, which we claim is us deregistering metals. But like all good demagogues, they never mention an even more tremendous, dramatic increase, larger increase in 2019 and 2020. Silver stocks registered with the COMEX rose very sharply at that period of time. And then they fell very sharply in after January 20. I believe the peak was in January of, of 2020. And the demagogues will say, well, you know, we're draining the COMEX inventories. But people who are in the silver market, who are actually honest, will say, well, you know, there is something which I won't bore you with the details. Something that was driving the, 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 the inventories higher at a period of rising silver prices. Um, and that has reversed. It has nothing or it has very, very little to do with draining the COMEX of deposit stocks. And if you can see, there's still plenty more. And COMEX stocks are there, down from their peak in 2020 before anybody tried to screw with the silver price and drive it to, to $1,500 or $200 or $300, or well, let's just say triple digits. Uh, you know, Before any of that garbage came along, COMEX stocks had already risen to record levels. And they're still at near historic highs, total eligible and registered. Registered stocks are down from where they were in 2020 before somebody tried to push the silver price to $100 or triple digits. But they're still at record levels compared to where they were at any given time. And they're at, not just record levels, they're multiples. They're five times higher than they were three years ago. So, yeah, don't get too excited about draining the COMEX inventories because they haven't been drained. And this, again, primarily reflects a reversal of this in 2000. 19-2020. One last chart on silver, if I can get back to it. COMEX open interest rose from 2001 through 2000 into July 2020. Since that time has fallen. The COMEX activity has actually fallen off. Kind of makes sense a little bit because of a lockdown and some other factors. It kind of actually factors into the Silver market mechanics that were reducing those registered inventories has uh, it suggests that there aren't a lot of people pouring into the silver market this year in the futures and options market uh, trying to fiddle with the price. A little bit talking about gold and silver, where we think they're going. Right now, you do have active December contracts in gold and silver on the COMEX. You have large open interest uh, remaining in those December contracts. It's being rolled over into February and, and March contracts. And that has helped push the prices of gold and silver higher over the last week or so. Not the only factor, there's been a lot of economic concerns, stock market concerns, political concerns, uh, interest rate issues, currency uh, issues 
that have caused investors to buy more gold and silver. If you look at some of the metrics that we follow, you'll see that whereas there was a bearish, uh, a very large bearish, historically large bearish attitude, posture toward gold and silver a few weeks ago, a couple months ago in the COMEX, that's largely dissipated now. And you're going back to a more traditionally uh, bullish uh, posture on the part of institutional investors in the in 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 the silver and gold futures contracts so our expectation is the prices stay relatively high between now and november 30th which is the first delivery day for the comex we wouldn't be surprised to see comex gold break above 1880 we wouldn't be surprised to see 1900 i'm not sure that it can go much further it's possible that we could see 1920 uh, if not in the last part of November, possibly in January or February of this year. Uh, silver, we're, you know, we're watching it. We think it's going to test at $26 and it could make a run to $28. We don't necessarily see a lot of uh, potential for prices over $28 in the next 10 trading days, nor in the next couple months but we do think that the bias is toward higher uh, prices for gold and silver. This is gold, this is silver. You can go to our, uh, the, uh, YouTube and you can find an introduction to CPM group about who we are, what we do. You can, be, uh, you can buy our yearbooks, you can become a retail investment program, or you can actually become a, a non-retail uh, client of ours too, because we have a lot of research and consulting that we do. And I owe a lot of people information about various ways that they can plug into CPM groups, research analysis and advisory services. We're, we've come up with three dates for our yearbook launches, gold yearbook in April, silver yearbook in May, uh, platinum in, in June. We traditionally since 2002 have been launching our gold yearbook in um, late March. We rolled it into April 6th because we are working with the International Precious Metals Institute on a Future of Gold one day seminar here in New York. It will be a round table discussion on, on what's happening with gold and where it's going in the long run. We've done, we did this for them a couple of times before in 2002 and then again around 2005. Uh, we've done it with other organizations with other topics like the future of mining and commodities hedging and stuff like that. So we're moving our gold yearbook to August, April 6th uh, because we uh, are doing this seminar on April 7th. Uh, then we've rolled silver into May. Used to be late April. We did it in early May this year and we'll do it in early May again next year. Uh, we have the, pro, uh, and then the platinum yearbook will come out in late June. We have a Platinum Group Metals uh, long-term outlook online webinar seminar that we're planning to do in late January. We are planning to do something, this is a title, Future Energy Sources, Auto Propulsion Technologies and Related Metals. Uh, the, another working title is Energy and Metals, but we'll look at what's happening with automotive propulsion technologies, how, what's going to happen, uh, how much petroleum are we going to be using in vehicles in 2050? Because the movement and the market share penetration of electric vehicles is not that fast. And the reality is that for decades to come, we're still going to be burning PG, uh, petroleum products in engines. We're still going to need pl platinum, palladium, and rhodium to clean the exhaust of those engines. And then we're going to need a lot of other metals uh for electric vehicles and other things that might come down the road that people aren't necessarily focusing on in the popular press right now uh so we'll talk about platinum group minerals we'll talk about manganese we'll probably talk about lithium and cobalt and 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 but we'll also focus on what what where, where the energy is going to be coming from over the next 30 years that's in early february uh, then we'll do an uh, online sem seminar on silver uh, the week before the, pro uh, the PDAC, the Prospectors and Developers of Can Association of Canada uh, conf uh, annual conference. We'll have our silver reception there and then the future of gold.
So we've got a lot of things coming up that you can plug yourself into in the first half of next year. Um, and as always, we have a variety of things. Take care. I'll talk to you next Tuesday. Uh, we are going to be taking next Friday off. So next Tuesday, we'll do a video, but we won't do one on, on Friday. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and be kind to others.